In this video, I'm going to go through some larger sequential games in game theory to uh, make sure we really understand this process of backward induction and the idea of a subgame perfect equilibrium. And to start with, I'm going to look at a game here we call the centipede game. Now, literally, centipede means 100 feet. Um, in this game, it's actually a nonapede game because we actually have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine feet here. But you can make a version of this game that has as many feet as you want, and you'll get the same answer. And this game is a sequential game. It's sort of an analogy for a sequential prisoner's dilemma. And um, with a prisoner's dilemma, Normally we think about it being a simultaneous game, but there's this incentive to make a choice that is selfish for yourself that hurts uh, the other player. Uh, it's, it's best for you in the sort of, I don't know, short run or, or if you're being self-centered. There's an outcome that is worse for both people if we could just cooperate, but it's just not strategically viable. Uh, the centipede game plays up on this same sort of idea. If we could somehow just both cooperate, we could be well off. But um, when we choose selfishly, and some would say sensibly, it just depends on the situation, uh, logically we will end up at what seems like a bad outcome. So let's see how this works. So we're going to use the standard tools of a sequential game which are to look at uh, using the process of backward induction and to look for what we call a subgame perfect equilibrium. So subgame perfect equilibrium. And what this involves is starting at the end of the game and asking what will the player at the end do? So let me describe what's going on here because this is a little bit different structure than other sequential games you normally see. The game starts with player A and he can either choose right or down. If he chooses down, the game's over. If he chooses right, then B gets a chance. B chooses right or down. If B chooses right, uh, sorry, down, the game's over. If he chooses right, the game continues and A gets another shot and so on all the way through the game. So backward induction would say, start at the end of the game and see what would B do if he got the last shot at the game. So what will B do? Well, we assume that B only cares about his own payoffs, not A's payoffs. So what B does is look at his 11, color-coded here in red, and B is also red. Um, if B goes down, he gets 11. If B goes right, he'll get 10. So B, at this point, his best choice is to go down for 11. So let me highlight that uh, choice. Let me put a little, maybe a little yellow box around here. Okay. And so B is going to choose down. Now, A, if he gets the shot, if he gets a chance to make this choice, if the game gets this far, A will look at his choice of right or down. A knows that if he goes right, B will go down. And so A knows, therefore, if he goes right, he's going to get 7. So we could put the number 7 right here. A knows if he goes right, he gets 7. A knows if he goes down, he gets 8. So what's A going to do? Well, A's best choice is to go down. So if the game gets this far, A's Logical choice is to end the game and take the 8 instead of giving the chance to B to give him 7. So, you see how this, this process is going to go all the way back. If B gets the choice right here, he can choose down, in which case he will get 5. So, if B chooses... So B is going to go down for that 5. So let's draw a little box around there. And um, Now A, when he gets his choice, he knows that in the next move, B will go down to get his 5, but A will only get 3. And so let me go back and, and, and make, make all the proper notes here to make sure we didn't skip anything. So B... 
uh, can choose either right where he knows that A is going to go down and so B would get 4 so let me sorry let me put that 4 there so B is basically choosing between 4 if he goes right 5 if he goes down so he's going to go down A knows that B is going to go down so if A goes right and B goes down A will get the green 3 here and so a is choosing between right for 3 or down for 4. Well, of course he's going to go down. And then um, B sees that if he gives A the chance, A will go down. Then B says, well, if I go right, I'm going to end up with this red 3. But if I go down, I can get 4. So B is going to go down for 4 and so on. And this game just unravels is the way a lot of people describe it. Uh, and... In the first move, A is going to see that if he goes right, B is going to go down. And so if A goes right, he's going to get 0. And if he goes down, he gets 1. So in the very first move, since everything unravels to the beginning, um, A is going to end the game before it has a chance to get started, basically. Because at every point... Um, let me fill it. Just fill in the numbers here real quick. If B goes right, A will go down, and then B would face getting three, but he could go down for four. And so uh, A could choose right, and B when B goes down, he will get two. So instead, he'll choose down for three. And working back to this step, if B goes right, A will go down. B would get one. So instead, B would choose down and end the game. For two, and so our subgame perfect equilibrium. Now, a subgame perfect equilibrium requires that at each step of the game that we could get to, that every person at every stage makes a rational decision. So it has to be a rational decision at every choice, and what that does is lead us back to the beginning, where the only rational decision would be for A to end the game at the beginning. Now this is sort of counterintuitive in one way because just like the Prisoner's Dilemma, which is you know the simultaneous game or the sequential version, we see that there's a better option here. What what is keeping us from getting to this clearly better option here, which is uh, ten and ten? If they could be patient and work together and somehow. Uh, put off their greed or something and cooperate then they could both get 10 but because at each step of the game there's an incentive to make a different choice um, so again let's just think about that very last choice B's not going to choose right so that they both get 10 B's going to choose down so that he gets 11 which would leave a 7 which means that a is not going to go right to give that B that choice. So this is sort of a mutually self-destructive behavior going on here. Um, so what we want to do as, as a part of game theory is try to figure out ways to try to cooperate in the long run. Try to be patient and be willing to give up in the short run so that you can have this long run gains uh, but one thing that we found destroys the potential for long run gains is if a game has a definite ending point. So that's one of the one of the things going on in the uh, centipede or the nonipede game here is that because it has a definite end, we can see that definite point in which at the last stage of the game, B is going to screw A. So at the next to the last, A screws B, and then B screws did 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 working back to the first um, it's, it's kind of a, a bad equilibrium but it's the only one that makes sense where every every player at every stage is making a logical choice so let's look at one other um, game here that's a little bit bigger and then turn it into a uh, sequential game so here's a simultaneous game because there's no indication of who's going first or second. So it's, when you look at a matrix, it must be a simultaneous game. And by using our standard analysis here, we want to figure out best responses. So here, let's call the red, 
Let's call these people the red player and the blue player. Red chooses A, B, C, D, or E, and blue chooses V, W, X, or Y. So, when, um, if red thinks blue is going to choose V, what's his best response? A for 9, B for 7, C for 5, D for 3, or E for 1. Well, A's best response would be A for 9. So let me put a little box there. What's uh, red's best response to blue? Uh, if he thinks blue's going to play W, well, red's, red's best choice would be E for 29. What's red's best response to X? Well, D. What's red's best response to Y? Looks like D again. Now we have to ask about blue's best responses. Here we're not talking about backward induction or subgame perfect equilibria. We're talking about Nash equilibria and dominant strategies. So um, we're looking at best responses here. Now, so if what if blue thought red was going to choose A? Blue's best response is either V for 9, W for 0, X for 6, or Y for 1, V for 9. What's blue's best response to B? Well, it's V again, V. What is uh, blue's best response to C? X. What's blue's best response to D? Well, he actually has do two equally good responses, V or Y. And what's blue's best response to E? Again, he has two equally good responses, X or Y. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned that there are two Nash equilibria, two places where each has best responded to the other, a mutual best response, and neither player would want to change their mind, therefore. So AV is one Nash equilibrium. Another Nash equilibrium is DY. So let's list those over there. So A... V is a Nash equilibrium, and so is dy. So dy is also a Nash equilibrium. And I'll make this a little bit bigger so that we can actually see it. Okay, well, that shouldn't be a period, that should be a comma. And so either one of these would be, in Nash's terminology, a reasonable prediction for what might happen at the end of this kind of game. Uh, reasonable, at least in the sense that neither player would say, Oh man, I want to change my mind. Why did I do that? So given what the other player has done, each player will say, eh, I, I made my best response. Uh, I, I can't change my mind and do any better. So there's no forehead slapping going on here and saying, Oh no, I wish I could change my mind. So, but, to Nash equilibria. Does either player have a dominant strategy? The answer is no. Now, uh, it looks like D for the red player is a pretty good strategy most of the time because D is a best response to V, X, oh, sorry, well, sorry, no, D is a best response to X or Y, but A is a best response for V. So, um, when we look at the red player, he he has best response for X and Y is D. Best response sometimes is E, sometimes is A. But uh, there's no dominant strategy for the red player because he has four different or three different choices that are best sometimes. So a dominant strategy would be if he has uh, one best choice all the time. Uh, what about the blue player? Does he have a dominant strategy? Well, no, he doesn't. Um, sometimes his best response is V. Three, for three things that red could do, his best response is V. But then sometimes he has a equally good response that's Y. Sometimes his best response is X, although there's an equally good response um, for X or Y when uh, red plays E, as we saw. Now, Let's see what happens if we were to turn this game into a sequential game where one player has to go first and then the next player goes second. And uh, let me get that set up and then we'll take a look. 
All right, so here I'm setting up a game where um, red goes first and then blue gets to go. And so I'm just setting these over here. Let me see, I'm going to have to move, space these out a little bit more. And let's, whoops, move these choices down here as well. So, so I'm setting up a game where we can actually see a structure we call this a game tree or an extensive form game extensive form game means we have extended the game out to where we can see who goes first and who goes second and so in the first stage of the game we're gonna have red go and let me make that a little bit bigger so that we can actually see here Red goes first, and normally we would draw lines between red and the A, B, C, D, but you know we don't actually have to do all that if we don't want to, as long as we understand what's going on here. That um, Let me make, actually make that a little bit smaller. I'm sorry, we have so many choices here. This is a quick and dirty uh, idea. I think you can maybe barely see. Okay, well, let me actually move over here and zoom in so that we can we can take this without having anything cut off. So red could choose A, and then blue gets to go and respond. So the way we solve this game is red says, suppose I chose A, and then blue got to respond, what would blue do? What would blue's best response be if I chose A? Now we already talked about this and what we know blue would do if uh, red chose A is choose V. And what, here's the important part, what would red get out of blue's response of V? Because red knows if I choose A, blue will choose V. So red now knows if they choose A, they're going to end up with 9. Okay, I need to change this font size to where it's a little bit bigger here so we can see what we're doing here. I'm sorry, I just need, I'll just do this by hand. So, uh, red knows if he goes A, he gets 9. Now, B, what if red chooses B? What is blue's best response? It's either V, W, X, or Y. It looks like it's V, so let me draw a box around uh blue's best response. So red looks ahead and sees that uh, blue's response to his going B would be V, and so red knows that he's going to end up with 7 if he chooses to go B. So B will end up with 7, and we'll make that bigger so we see it. And now red says, well, what would happen if I chose C? What would blue's best response be? V, W, X, or Y? Well, it's going to be X. All right there. And now red knows if red chooses C, he's going to end up with 1. So that's probably not what, not what red wants to do. All right. Now red says, but what if I went D? What's blue's best response? V, W, X, or Y? Well, here is where we get into a little bit of a problem in a sequential game. If, if people have two options as a response that are equally good, then it makes it impossible for red to know uh, what blue's response would be in this case. It could be V, in which case red gets three. It could be Y, in which case uh, red is going to end up with five. So, so this adds kind of a conundrum here, which you can. How do we analyze this kind of thing? Well, there are a few ways you can you can talk about this, but I think what makes the most sense is to say, look, in a sequential game, red cannot accurately foresee how. Uh, how blue is going to react in that case? He could end up with, uh, so red could end up with three, could end up with five, and red's going to have to live with the uncertainty of not knowing. So if he chooses D, he could end up with three or five. Now maybe this isn't an important problem for him, but let's let's go ahead and see what 
would happen if red chose E, what is blue's best response going to be here? Well, it's going to be uh, blue's best response would be again. Oh, here we have another the same problem as we saw before that uh, blue could choose X or could choose Y. So in this case, red is sitting here saying, well, if I choose E, I really don't know how blue's going to respond. I might end up with seven or I could end up with three. I really don't know. Well, let's see if it matters. Let's see if it matters. Let's take a step back here. So if red chooses A, he knows he'll end up with 9. If he chooses B, he'll end up with 7. C, 1, D, either 3 or 5. E, th 7 or 3. So if you're red, what are you going to do? Well, if we're red, now it's clear what we should do. We should choose A. Because if we choose A, we know for sure we're going to end up with 9. So our, by using backward induction, our subgame perfect Nash equilibrium is that when red goes first, our prediction is that um, red is going to choose A. So red will choose A and end up with 9. And then blue is going to respond with W. Oh, sorry, V. And he is going to end up with 9 as well. Okay. So that is our subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. If everybody behaves rationally at every choice they get, this is our prediction when red goes first. Now let me set up the game where blue goes first and see what we would predict in that case. And again, as always, I'll put this worksheet on Berkey Academy so that you can look at it and, and play along at home if you want to. So go to www.berkeyacademy.com and let me give this file a name so you can see what it's going to be called. If you wanted to download it yourself, uh, I will call this file um, Game Theory with uh, Big Sequential. So I'll call it Game Theory Big Sequential PDF, and I'll save it on www.berkeyacademy.com under Files for you if you want this. So now I'm going to set up the game just so we can see what happens if blue went first. Okay, here I have set up an extensive form game or a game tree, and I've kind of set it up the other way around. So blue chooses either V, W, X, or Y, and then we see red gets to respond after each of these choices. And so again, normally people will draw lines everywhere, and normally I do too, but you know, you get enough lines going here. The lines aren't really informative. We know what, you know, as long as you draw something to where you understand what's happening at each stage, having lines going everywhere is not really important. So blue goes first, he says, what if I choose V, what would red respond? And so we know red would respond A. And so if blue chooses V, then blue is going to end up with 9. So what if blue cho chose W? How would red respond? Well, we know red would respond with 29 here. So, sorry, E for 29. But blue would get 0. So blue knows, well, if I, if I do zero, uh, W, I'm getting 0. If I go V, I'm getting 9. If blue chooses X, red will respond with D. So what will blue get? Well, blue would get 4 for doing that. And finally, blue knows that if he chooses Y, red's best response is going to be D. And so if Red, uh, blue chooses Y. He knows that when red sees him choose Y, red will choose D, uh, and blue would end up with 9. So let's mark that down here. So a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium and a, and a um, prediction here. What we want to do is, is 
try to say, hey, what will happen in this game? What will blue do? And then what will red do? Well, here we have kind of a problem, and sometimes that happens. You can't really predict what the first player will do. Will he choose W? Will the first player choose X? Will he choose V or will he choose Y? Here we have a problem. We don't know what uh, blue is going to choose because blue is indifferent between choosing V or Y. And so in this case, it's not clear, so we don't want to say that we, we have one clear prediction. We could say, well, there are two different ways this game could go. Either blue could end up with going V and then and getting 9, and then um, red would respond with A and get 9, or... Blue could just as reasonably choose to go Y. So blue could choose to go Y, and blue will get 9, and then red could respond with D and get 5. And so there are two different equilibria here. Neither one of these predictions is any better than any other as, as far as I can tell. The only tie-breaking sort of thing you could possibly do is to say, well... Normally in these games, we assume that blue doesn't care about red's payoffs. Blue only cares about blue's payoffs. We could say, well, maybe blue secondarily does care about red's payoffs. But there are two, way that he, two ways in the real world that he could care about red's payoffs. He could care if he does. Usually we assume he doesn't. But he could care and say, you know, well... All else equal, I would like red to have a better payoff. And if you think that's the kind of feeling that people would have in this game, then we would go with this equilibrium, where uh, blue might lean towards choosing V because that's better for A. But it's equally plausible in a different kind of situation that blue might say, well, ceteris paribus, all else equal, I want red to be worse off. Maybe this is a, com a business competitor of yours, and if your competitor is worse off today, maybe he has less resources to uh, invest in better technology to uh, compete with you in the future, and so you'll be better off. So, again, without some kind of tie-breaking arrangement, we, don't really, we can't really predict what would happen in this sequential game. But now let's compare the two situations, um, where blue goes first, Blue will definitely end up with 9, and red could end up with either 9 or 5. Let's see, compare that to the situation where red went first. When red goes first, we're clear on what red's going to do. Red's going to go A for 9, and then blue will respond with V for 9. So, is there a first mover advantage, or a second mover advantage, or neither in this game? Well, I would say red would prefer to go first. Blue doesn't care. Blue gets nine either way. So I'd say there's kind of a weak, a, in a weak sense here, there's a first mover advantage because red would want to prefer to go first to guarantee he gets nine because if red goes second, he, has a, he stands a chance of, of getting five only. Blue is indifferent. So maybe a weak first mover advantage in this case. Now again, this... This weak sort of discussion only, only occurs here because in this game we have several choices that players are indifferent between. Uh, if, if there are no, are no sets of choices that players are going to be indifferent between, then you would avoid the problem where you can't predict what will, people will do in a sequential game like this. So I just wanted to show you these two interesting uh, sequential games. This one, the centipede game, and uh, another sequential game where we looked at a, a little bit larger simultaneous game and then turned it into a sequential game just to see what happened. So again, this is Berkey Academy signing off. If you have any questions, please leave a comment or question in the comment section below.